Hey, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Reynolds, and I am, uh, I'm from Sierra Tucson, and I am the director of the Red, White, and Blue program here, which is a, it's a program that is specifically designed for military and first responders uh, who suffer from trauma, but also as well as addiction and mood issues. And we're having this webinar because we are honoring our veterans in, you know, in honor of uh, Veterans Day, November 11th. And I think it's really important to continue to get the word out that we have a lot of our, our combat veterans or just veterans in general that are, that are suffering for, vi for a variety of reasons. So Veterans Day actually goes back to 1919 was the first year that we celebrated that, and that was one year after the end of, uh, of World War I, which you know, we know is Armistice Day. So that's a day, you know, Veterans Day is a day that we pay tribute to our living veterans. Of course, we, you know, honor our deceased veterans as well. So if you know any veterans out there, give them a hug and thank them for their, for their service. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps birthday is on November 10th, the day before Veterans Day. And the Marine Corps is 244 this year. Hoorah. And also the Veterans Administration, they're getting a lot of press now because they, you know, they have a very large responsibility for taking care of our vets. I, uh, I want to give a shout out to all of those, all those clinicians who may work with the VA. Uh, you guys do phenomenal work. And it seems like, you know, the only time we, you know, we hear anything from the VA is, is when, unfortunately, somebody is committing suicide or, you know, people are complaining. So I just think that, uh, the, you know, the people that work at the VA deserve our honor. They deserve our respect for what you do in caring for our vets. And I know that our, our VA here in Tucson is, is phenomenal. So uh, just personally, a little bit of a personal note, I did serve in the Navy for 30 years. I was active duty from 82 until 2012, came in as a hospital corpsman, spent a lot of time with the Marines. Uh, about halfway through my career, I got selected for a PA school, and uh, for the remainder of my time in, served in a variety of roles from shipboard to Iraq in 2004 to serving as a medical officer with a SEAL team. And it really uh, it was really always an honor for me to, to take care of our vets. And, you know, we have a lot of Marines and sailors that I personally dealt with that, that suffer from, you know, from PTS. And uh, just, you know, it's important that we, again, uh, honor honor these folks. I have to say just real quick, you know, ever since 9-11, I can't believe that it's almost uh, next year is going to be 20 years since 9-11 happened. I had, uh, you know, combat operations have been nonstop since that time. I still remember I was on a carrier that day and I was watching the events unfold in New York and uh, we were pulling into port in San Diego and we quickly turned around as we saw what was happening and we stayed out at sea for a couple other, a couple more weeks until we felt it was safe to pull back into port, and then two months later, we're off the coast of Afghanistan. So, you know, the the military has not stopped since 9/11, and the significant you know stressors have been placed on our our troops, our guys, and our gals. And many of them have done repeated deployments, not only to Iraq and Afghanistan, but we have lots of other things going on going on around the world as well, with you know combat wise and and repeated deployments. So it definitely has taken its toll. Uh, just real quick, I wanted to go over some numbers. You know, going back to World War One, when we talk about you know casualties, we had about four million people that served during World War One, and 116,000 veterans died in that war. World War Two, we actually had 400,000 people that died in that war, and 16 million people served. Korean War, uh, a little a little bit less involvement. You know, we had 36,000 serve. We had five million people. Uh, I'm sorry, 36,000 people that died in combat and non-combat, and 5 million people served. Vietnam, we had 58,000 deaths uh, from combat, and we had about 8 million people serve. Currently, most recently, going back to the 9-11 era, the global war on terror, Iraq and Afghanistan, we have a total of about 6,600 deaths. So when you compare that to World War II, where almost half a million people died, that's a, that's a, lot, no, a lot lower number. But the reason for that is, you know, obviously military medicine has gotten better. You know, if if a, if a service member is reached on the on the battlefield uh, with a medevac helicopter, they have a greater than 90% chance of surviving. So the you know the death rate has gone has gone down. But we have a lot more people that are that are living with uh, very serious injuries. So med medevac capabilities definitely have gotten better. 
Again, this webinar is sponsored by Sierra Tucson, and thanks, thanks so much for this. We, uh, we really enjoy doing these things and, and sharing information with clinicians out there. With regards to any kind of Q&A you may have, you can submit a question on the bottom left of your screen any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. And all the questions are going to be answered during the last 10 minutes of the program. There's also a PDF of the presentation and additional resources under the headshot image located on the left of your screen. And of course, you can see there, for any sort of help, you can email Melissa Pangaro at her email address there. And of course, this is the credit information with NADAC. In order to receive credit, you have to watch this program all the way through the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please do not leave the console. And you can continue to stay on the platform, uh, and you will automatically be redirected to an eval landing page at the end. So it's really important that you, that, that you uh, do that. If this is the first time that you've done a webinar in 2019, you're going to need to create a NACCME account when you're first directed to the landing page, which is very simple. And then for any webinar that you go to after that, you'll already have an account, and you'll just need to log in. So remember your, your password. Once you're done with the evaluation, you can download or print your certificate. And NADAC credit, I just want to make a point, it is offered only for the live broadcast. Okay, so sort of a quick historical overview. You know, uh, PTSD, as, as we call it now, I mean, I don't really like to say the D part of that. I, you know, I think most of us uh, would agree that it's not, it's not a disorder, but, you know, that's, that's what we call it in the DSM-5. So if you actually look at, uh, you know, references to post-traumatic stress, I mean, they actually go, they go way back. Uh, you know, actually, there's there's more than a few verses in the in the Bible that refer to this. Believe it or not, there have been various terms over the years. You can see there on the slide. We you know in the Civil War, soldiers hard, and then we have shell shock, battle fatigue. But it really was the Vietnam veterans in 1980 that uh, actually was responsible for getting post PTSD in the in the DSM at that time, and that was the DSM three. And they were actually you know they actually held very very large marches, and I believe it was in New York City. Uh, in support of this, because when the Vietnam vets came home, remember they they didn't exactly get a lot of uh, love from from our country, you know, from our countrymen here in the United States. Uh, they they were not treated well at all. So there's actually you know the PTSD references also go back to Shakespearean literature. A lot of people think that Henry the Fourth, if anybody had post traumatic stress, it was him. So this really started getting more uh, more interest uh, around the time of World War One, and there was a British psychiatrist by the name of Myers who started studying this, and he's the one that that coined the term shell shock. So they observed, you know, he observed that you know people that were that uh, people that were close to artillery shells going off, you know, obviously sometimes you could be actually hit by by uh, shrapnel from those shells, but even people that weren't damaged uh, or injured, so to speak, from the shell itself, just the, the stress of the loud, exposure, uh, the loud explosions, people suffered, uh, began suffering these neuroses, as they called it. So, you know, guys were developing uncontrollable diarrhea, uh, facial tics, and, and some guys, uh, many, many people were, you know, this was a hand-to-hand -hand combat as well. So for many of the soldiers that had bayon bayoneted somebody, they would develop often pains in the area of which uh, from the person that they actually bayoneted. And it was felt that, you know, these symptoms were actually pretty contagious as well. So you can have a, you know, you can have a battle buddy who was suffering from post-traumatic stress and it was, you know, some of you may recall the term hysteria as well, which could, which can spread rather rapidly. So it got to the point where many of the soldiers were so, were so damaged by the, uh, you know, when I say damaged, I mean bought, uh, inflicted from the from the psychic wounds. I'm not talking about physical injuries. That they had to set up special psychiatric hospitals, and they actually had more psychiatric hospitals in World War One than they did medical facilities, which was was very interesting. And it just there were so many soldiers that were experiencing fright and anxiety. So oftentimes they would also become mute. They would become deaf. Uh, people would develop uncontrollable tremors. Some people couldn't walk, you know, which we know now is a, is a conversion disorder, and other people developed convulsions. This slide, I, I, I had to include this. I, I included it on the, the last one we did a couple years ago. I just thought this was a, 
quite the quite the contraption, and I believe that uh, the British psychiatrist Myers was responsible for this because we really didn't know how to how to treat people at that time for you know the PTS symptoms. So we thought that shocking people, you know, giving them electrical shocks would somehow you know would somehow bring them into their right mind. And uh, this didn't go on for a long time, fortunately. Ultimately, it was actually it was deemed to be cruel, you know, cruel and. Uh, basically a punishment. Actually, Sigmund Freud himself uh, became involved in this and actually, I, I believe, uh, testified it at, at a couple of hearings that, that this was counterproductive for our soldiers. So, you know, what did we do with all the soldiers that at that time that were involved in this intense hand-to-hand -hand combat? You know, we had the psychiatric hospitals, but like, then what? So it was initially felt, well, let's send them back home to wherever they came from, whether it was England whether it was uh, America, you know, when we ultimately became involved in the war. But we found that the soldiers that were sent home, it actually created kind of a chronic disability in them. They were removed from their unit, and all of a sudden they were isolated. So the consensus over time became that treatment should occur near the front lines. And, you know, with the expectation like, hey, we're going to keep you close to the front lines, we're going to... Uh, you know, sometimes where they could even hear the artillery explosions and the expectation would be that, hey, you're going back to, you know, going back to duty. So they also got emotional support from their comrades. A lot of these facilities uh, were, were run by NCOs. They weren't even necessarily uh, predominantly medical people. So over time, it was it was found like, hey, the, the, the closer that we're treating people to the front lines, the better results that we're having. So it's really important to remember that cohesion is such an important part of the military experience that, you know, even if you're going through hell over there and getting shot at and whatnot, it, you're not doing, you know, you're not by yourself. So the, the cohesion piece is, is very important. And again, there were a couple studies done that showed the people that were sent home, they just, they had a poor prognosis. And a lot of them continued to experience PTS symptoms for many, many years, and they were discharged. So, and they actually, we're going to be talking a little bit later, but there was, a, there was another psychiatrist that developed the term biceps with regards to treating, uh, you know, treating post-traumatic stress casualties. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. So here we go. This is, you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. I just wanted to touch upon this real briefly. This is the, the DSM-5 PTSD uh, diagnostic criteria. You all know that we have different criterion. We have criterion A all the way through criterion H. Uh, and you guys, can, you guys can read that on your own. But in order to meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD, you have to meet in each one of these, uh, each one of the criterions, you have to meet a minimum of one. There are two of the criterions. I can't remember which ones they are, to be honest with you, where, but you have to meet two of those. So that's just the reason I bring that up is because we have more than a few people that have come to Sierra Tucson that have had the diagnosis of PTSD. And you know, when we looked a little bit closer, they really didn't. Most of them met the diagnostic criteria for you know, other specified trauma and stressor-related disorder. So you know, just because a, a combat veteran has nightmares uh, doesn't, you know, most minds immediately go to uh, post-traumatic stress. You know, that's certainly a component of it, but there's a lot more than that. And one thing I just want to mention here that is about sleep. Uh, for the people that we see, you know, in my experience, sleep disturbance is a huge, huge presenting symptom as well. And it's, it's estimated that it affects like 90% of veterans out there. So uh, it's important to also remember that the gold standard for treatment for a sleep disorder is not Ambien, it's not Lunesta, it's actually CBT. And I know that doesn't always get us the, the immediate effects that we would like, but I always make it a make it a point to educate my patients that you know certain certainly medications can help, but it's not everything. So okay, going to the next slide. Here's some more of the criterion, and uh, at the very end there, you can you can see the the mention of the dissociative symptoms. So. Uh, there are two specifications for dissociative, and so in addition to meeting the other criteria for diagnosis, there are many people, as we know, that develop uh, dissociative disorders, and most commonly these are depersonalization or derealization. Depersonalization, as you know, is commonly described as a sensation of sort of floating out of your body, maybe looking down on it. Derealization is just a pervasive sense that things around a person are not real. So. 
And of course, in addition to the dissociative specification, we also have the delayed one. There are some people that don't, you know, that don't uh, experience any symptoms for several months. So if it takes approximately six months for the symptoms to show up, then we will call that uh, delayed, a delayed specification. So again, back to the diagnostic criteria. Most symptoms for PTS usually begin within the first three months. But again, again, uh, as I just mentioned, there can certainly be a, be a delay. We know that the sooner that we identify people that have PTS, the better response they have to treatment, they have a better prognosis, and uh, many times symptoms can be resolved. Uh, here it says six months, but you know, everybody's different. I mean, some people can take a few years to get better, but with fairly consistent treatment, uh, most people do you know, do do improve considerably to the point where they're, you know, they're functional and it's not impairing their ability to function on a daily basis. Uh, we talk about the delayed expression here. So again, these are the folks that it can take, you know, sometimes up to six months uh, or later. And it's felt that, you know, studies have shown that people that have delayed expression generally just have a, a poor prognosis. The one thing I want, it was interesting with the DSM-5, and again, that was done in 2013, made a, a number of evidence-based revisions to that. So previously, we used to identify uh, PTS as a fear-based kind of an anxiety disorder, and, which was extrapolated on from the DSM-3 and the DSM-4. So what changed is, you know, the current diagnostic criteria we have are marked by negative con uh, cognitions and mood states. So you see a lot of uh, a lot of depression in, in our patients that suffer from this, in addition to a lot of times having the disruptive behaviors. So it's in its uh, PTSD is now in its own category. It's in the trauma and stressor related disorders. So in the onset of each of these uh, has to be preceded by an event of an exposure to a traumatic event or some kind of adverse environmental event. And also, indirect exposure was added with the DSM-5. So, for example, learning about the violent or accidental death of a loved one or a friend or learning that, you know, sexual violence was perpetrated on a loved one can, uh, can, can be meeting the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress. Now, interestingly enough, electronic media like watching, you know, watching TV, for example, watching the World Trade Center being attacked in 9-11, that does not that is not considered a traumatic event. I mean, we could certainly argue, I, I, I think that it is, but as far as the DSM goes, it's not. And remember also that indirect exposure, for example, uh, policemen, uh, military people, you know, body handlers, that also is considered traumatic. So all the, again, I just wanna stress that anybody with post-traumatic stress has to have, at the onset, you know, they have to have that identifying, that criterion A event, and their symptoms have to have been exacerbated or began after that specific event in order to, to meet the criteria for that. Okay, we'll go along to the next slide here. So this is something I just wanted to educate you all. You know, if you're not if you're not dealing with military people, this is something that we that we do use in the military and combat operational stress reaction. I just I want to emphasize this is not in the DSM. This is a military created diagnosis that we use uh, for ourselves. These are for acute events that typically last for less than 72 hours. So, you know, nobody nobody is uh, somebody that has a somebody that has this, it's not, you know, they're not being labeled with, you know, PTSD or or anything like that. This is just a, an internal term if you will and it has to do with combat stress. So you can read the clinical manifestations there. Typically it's ex exhaustion, people have nightmares, uh, worry, irritability. And then the way that we handle this is the biceps. And I mentioned that earlier. So the biceps term again came into, came into use uh, back in World War I and this is how we wanna do our initial management for, for people that have this uh, sort of a stress reaction. So the B in biceps stands for brevity. That means that we want the treatment to last anywhere from one to three days. I is immediacy. That means that we want to get you know intervention as soon as possible. We want to remind that the, the the patient that they're still part of the unit and they're still part of the team. Uh, C is uh, stands for contact. You know we want to have frequent contact with with these people. And again, these uh, in theater, you know where we have these these small facilities, typically staffed by you know by uh, behavioral health technicians, but also. NCOs and uh, non-military people, just to, to uh, 
make sure that you know the that cohesion piece is there. E stands for expectancy. That means hey, you're going to be you know what you're experiencing is normal, and come on, let's have some rest, and we're going to get you back up there. And then P is proximity. This means that we're keeping the the patient close to their unit. We're not sending them, you know, medevacing them to, to Germany or, or back to the States unless it's a, a very, very severe case. And, of course, S stands for simplicity. Simplicity is always good. This is where we just basically want to be supportive. We want to be non-judgmental of these, of these people. We want to focus on their strengths. You know, sometimes they require hydration. We need to take them up with some IV fluids and make sure that they, they get some food on board. And I can tell you, when I first uh, when I first came in the Navy, uh, I was a behavioral health technician way long time ago, and we did not have a lot of behavioral techs or psych techs, as we were called back then, with Marine units. Now we have something called the Oscar team, uh, which actually, where, where you find Marines uh, fighting overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan, you will have an Oscar team there, and that stands for Operational Stress Control and something. I'm sorry, I don't know. But it consists of a psychiatrist or a psychologist as well as a small team of behavioral health technicians. So, and that's, uh, you know, they're the ones that reinforce the importance of, of getting our guys back to, our guys and gals back to duty as soon as possible. So a little bit, just real briefly about the neurobiology of trauma. You know, most of you may be familiar with Porges' polyvagal theory. Anybody that can make it through that book is my hero. It's pretty dry, but it does have a lot of very, very good information. And the essence of that is, as we know now, is that uh, trauma is, is dysregulation of our nervous system, right? So after any kind of trauma, whether it's combat or a car accident or a natural disaster, we do actually have changes that occur within the brain and the body. You know, our brain cell records memories and embeds it uh, in our memories often, and we develop these new trauma-related neural pathways. And what happens is once we have those pathways, they can repeatedly reactivate over time if not treated appropriately. Real quick, a little bit, you know, uh, brain stuff here, brain, brain lesson, let's call it. The reptilian brain is also known as the, you know, that's the brain stem. That's the, that's the most basic part of our brain, and that's what we utilize. That's our survival instinct. You know, that's what causes us to breathe. Uh, and various other autonomic body processes. Our limbic or our midbrain, that's the mid part of the brain. This is where we process emotions and we have sensory uh, input and output. And then, of course, we know that the neomammalian brain, also known as the cortex or the forebrain, this is our most highly evolved part of the brain. And this is, you know, this is what, this is our executive functioning, right? This is what uh, allows us to make decisions and assess situations. And oftentimes, when people are in traumatic situations, this thing goes offline, right? Because we go into uh, the reptilian brain takes over and we go into reactive mode. So whenever anybody experiences, you know, a fight or flight type situation, this is basically shutting down all non-essential body functions and uh, mind processes and we go into survival mode. So this is where we go into the, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. We have stress hormones that kick in and, you know, we fight, flee or freeze. And, of course, the amygdala is the smoke alarm in our, in our brains that sends a signal, and the amygdala is responsible for releasing epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. And, again, the, front, the frontal lobe shuts down. So, anyways, and then we go, here, here's the good news, though, right? We know that uh, with trauma treatment, we know that these traumatic changes can be re reversed. Just like we, many people with untreated trauma, develop these new traumatic neural pathways, we know that with appropriate treatment, we can reverse those over time. And the goal, of course, is to get our nervous system back into regulation to where we're functioning, you know, in that normal sort of parasympathetic mode. You know, we, we can certainly go into fight or flight if we have to, but we nobody wants to be walking around in, in that state. So prevalence, just a just a quick slide on the prevalence of post-traumatic stress. You know, most most people will will develop, uh, I think it's 80% of people will develop or, or will experience at least one traumatic event during their lifetime. But you know what? The, ma the vast majority of people do not develop post-traumatic stress. We know that it's twice as common in women versus men. Women, of course, unfortunately, are subjected to, uh, to more sexual assaults and domestic violence than, than men are. Uh, but... As far as women go, the, the, most common, uh, the most common types of trauma they experience are rape, sexual molestation, being physically attacked, 
but also childhood physical abuse. Uh, as far as men go, it's combat exposure, of course, rape. There, men, men do experience sexual assaults, childhood neglect, and, but also childhood physical abuse. And uh, males are much more likely to be physically abused as kids than, than females are. So, and we know that, you know, we talk about developmental trauma. I mean, we can do a whole other lecture on this, but developmental trauma, there's actually uh, momentum uh, getting out there to include this as a, as a, new, as a new diagnosis uh, in the DSM at some point. But we know childhood trauma, uh, you know, abuse and neglect, that's the single, that's one of the most significant public health challenges that we have here. Uh, the vast majority of the trauma we know starts at home. And you know what? 80% of people that receive uh, that receive this uh, this trauma, it's perpetrated by their caregivers. So people they're supposed to you know they're supposed to trust, people that are supposed to protect them. Unfortunately, so it's a huge, huge. It's very common, and it has a really high impact for the remainder of their life. Actually, if it you know if it continues, we know the complex trauma is you know people that experience multiple chronic and prolonged developmentally adverse effects, you know, traumatic effects, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, community violence, war, I mean, it goes, it goes on and on. But complex trauma usually occurs, again, within, within the family. So the, one of the questions I commonly get asked is, how, you know, how can you have two people in a, in a foxhole, shall we say, and one of them, uh, they're both involved in the same experience, the same firefight, and one of them goes on to develop post-traumatic stress and the other one doesn't. Well, I don't know if there's an easy answer for that. We certainly know we're learning more and more about resiliency. But it's also, I always just remember, you know, well, let's take a look at these two people. Even though they were in the same foxhole, they very likely could have had significant, you know, significant differences while growing up. So many of you may have heard about the ACE study. If you haven't, I strongly urge you to go online, go to TED Talks, and, uh, or just go online and Google ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences. There's a physician, I cannot recall her name, but I believe she's now the Surgeon General of California. And uh, she has really done a lot to publicize the results of this uh, groundbreaking study. And it was, it was done in California with, at Kaiser, the Kaiser Permanente Health System, it involved 17,000 people. And they surveyed uh, these people asking about adverse childhood experiences. So the, the numbers were pretty staggering. About 30% reported physical abuse, 19% had sexual abuse, 11% emotional abuse, 23% were exposed to family alcohol abuse, 20% witnessed their mothers being battered, and 18% were exposed to mental illness. So, so what's the significance of this, you might ask? Well, people that have high ACE scores as they grow up and they, you know, they mature throughout their life, they experience depression, suicide attempts, alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual promiscu promiscuity, domestic violence, cigarette smoking, obesity, and sexually transmitted diseases. They are generally much, very, very much unhealthier, and many of them go on to develop cancer and even heart disease. So, uh, you know, the repeated traumatization in, in kids growing up just has such significant effects, you know, not only on their mind, but on their brain. And, uh, you know, the ACE is, is something that a lot of facilities are using to screen now. And I would highly encourage you, if you're not familiar with the ACE, it's a really easy uh, screening tool to, to administer and, and check it out. And definitely check out that TED Talk. Anyways, back to the slide in the military, you can see that the, the average uh, PTS that we're seeing is around 15% right now. And it was about, it was a little bit less in Gulf War veterans, uh, about 15% of Vietnam vets. And then, of course, we, we, know, we all know that the, uh, the, the huge number of suicides that are going on right now with veterans, but there's also a general upward trend in suicides in the general population, interestingly enough. But Many of you have probably heard about 22, approximately 20 to 22 suicides a day from uh, from veterans. So it's a huge problem, and I know it's also it's a big focal point right now as well with the uh, with the Veterans Administration. So this is just a cool little uh, cool little slide here, just kind of uh, talking about what I what I just said. Uh, combat operations in Afghanistan, kind of like I said earlier, it's been over 19 years now. Uh, that was referred to as Operation Enduring Freedom, and then we, we got into Iraq in 2003, and of course that was called Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
since that time, we've had various different names for different operations going on around uh, in both of those countries. And we've had, I believe, two million, two to two and a half million people have deployed at least one time, and many of those people have deployed on repeated occasions. I mean, you know, the good thing about being with the Marines is whenever we deployed, the Marines are really good about keeping deployments to six to seven months. I know at one point the Army was requiring that their soldiers uh, remain in Afghanistan and Iraq for up to 18 months, which I, I, I personally, I, I mean, I could not imagine that. And then they come home and they start training for deployment, and many of them just go back again. Uh, not everybody uses the VA when they get out, but one of, some of the most common things that people experience from combat besides the trauma is a lot of musculoskeletal injuries and uh, Traumatic brain injuries actually are very, very common as well, and we'll be talking about that just a little bit later. So again, I talked about the medevac capabilities now are, are, are great, I mean, but it can be a double-edged sword. You know, a lot of the guys surviving are, uh, you know, there's many of them that, I can think of two or three that I've met, actually wish that they had not made it on the battlefield because their quality of life is, is, uh, is so poor. So survivability is up, but... Consequently, we have lots and lots of service members that are uh, are living with pretty severe injuries. Going on to just talk about just in general in the military, we know that despite the numbers that we have from all the studies that are going on, we know that post-traumatic stress is uh, is definitely underreported. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of stigma, and you know in the military culture, it's you know it's just not. It's just not, we, I mean, we say that we encourage it. I mean, I think we do at the upper levels. You know, I, I used to hear about it all the time from the chief of naval operations or the commandant of the Marine Corps. You'd see posters all over the place. But you know what? It really, the leadership takes place at what we call the deck plate level. So you can have the generals and the admirals, you know, advocating for you to seek help for, for uh, PTS. But, you know, if your sergeant is telling you that he's going to make your life hell if you go to sick call because, you know, you're having nightmares or whatever, it's just uh it's not a good thing. So it's an ongoing it's an ongoing thing in the military to really try to continue to destigmatize uh asking for help. Uh, and again the, the leadership on this is is just huge. It's so important. Rand, the Rand Corporation did the big study. This is a very well known study back in two thousand eight, and you can certainly read through that, but you can see that greater than half of the people uh, that have deployed, reported having seen a friend seriously wounded or killed. And a lot of them also, almost as many people, saw lots of dead and, and wounded non-combatants. You know, back in World War I, prior, I mean, up until that time, war was always very personal, and it was, well, it still is personal, but it was, it was focused on your, your enemy. With World War II, there was a concept that came up, and it was called total war. So this is where you saw, you know, not only uh, active, you know, not only soldiers and sailors uh, getting getting involved in the fight, but the enemy would also target civilian populations. So obviously the, the Holocaust and one of the one of the most horrific things uh, ever. But you know they would also bomb London. People that lived through World War II, the bombings in London, you know Hitler. So there's a lot of innocent people, so to speak, that are that are. Uh, you know that that our troops are exposed to often uh, unfortunately women and children and uh yeah so just remember that the PTS obviously goes you know just goes way beyond just uh our immediate circle of you know seeing our comrades wounded the majority of the people that are seeking care at the VA right now are the age of uh, 20 to 29 and the army by far leads that they're the highest utilizer of care. I think it's around 65% is the latest number uh, I heard. And but there are many people that get out of the uh, that do get out of the military and never seek help with the VA. So that's a you know that's a lot of a lot of our people out there that I I don't understand why this happens. But there's a, there's a perception that unless you do 20 years in the military, you're not eligible for care at the VA, and that's that's absolutely not true. I've had several people come uh, come through Sierra Tucson that, you know, they did their time in the military, they did four years, whatever, and I asked them about, you know, their VA experience, and they, they were under the impression they couldn't seek care there. So if you did, you know, if you have an honorable discharge from the military, and it doesn't just have to be, on, I mean, you can't seek care if you have like a dishonorable discharge or a bad conduct discharge, but definitely an honorable, and there's a couple of something, a couple of levels just below honorable, you, then you are eligible to seek care at the, at the VA. 
So that's uh, that's something that if you ever you know run into a former military person, you can always inquire about. So the aftermath, the the sequelae, as we say, of post traumatic stress. We know. The, in, the intensity of the combat trauma means that a person is generally at higher risk for suicide, as well as increased risk for suicidal thoughts. You can read those suicide risk factors there. Uh, it tends to you know, affect the enlisted people uh, more than the officers. Uh, anybody that has a prior mental health diagnosis, uh, you know, marital, marital issues, of course, substance use is a, is a big one. And of course, uh, childhood trauma. Again, there's more than a few people that have joined the military to escape really bad home situations. So, you know, everybody that's coming into the military isn't obviously a, a nice, shiny, fresh, well-adjusted uh, individual. So those those people are always going to be at higher risk of developing PTS. Again, uh, we know that we know that people that that have this diagnosis, you know, they they like to self-medicate. Most commonly in the in the military, it's it's alcohol. Uh, the military has gone out of their way to sort of deglamorize uh, the use of alcohol over the past several years, but you know it's still a problem. It's still number one problem as far as substances go. There's always a, there's always a, a sailor or a service member trying to get around the drug test. So spice uh, was a few things. I remember when I was when I was still in, a bunch of people got got in trouble for using spice or ecstasy. Uh, occasionally, people will, you know, will smoke marijuana, but of course, that's, you know, you're smoking smoking marijuana. That's hard to beat on a on a drug test. And we actually, uh, in the military, we do have the option for people, you know, people that want to get help for alcohol. We we do have alcohol rehabilitation centers. Uh, I believe the current the current thought with military people and using drugs, it's zero tolerance. So, you know, if you get if you get popped on a drug test, you you can ask for help certainly, and they'll, they'll send you to treatment. But you're, that's going to result in a more than likely an administrative discharge as well. So co-occurring disorders, we know we know that it's, uh, that this is a huge thing. So if if somebody has PTSD, their, their chances are very high, greater than 80%, that they have at least one co-occurring mental health disorder. Again, substance use is certainly one of the one of the big ones. So this is the importance of doing a good history. You know, when we see people for the first time, we we want to ask about their substance use, prior, you know, psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, you know, have they been to treatment before? Have they been on medications before? And you know, just trying to get the most complete picture uh, as possible. I, I, and I just have to tell you from my own experience here at Sierra Tucson, I, I can't tell you how many people I've had in my office that have been in treatment multiple previous times for addiction. We'll say alcohol and opiates are the most common now. But as I get to know them, and you know, as I, as I do their psychiatric evaluation, I find they have a history of, you know, oftentimes pretty horrific trauma. And I ask the question, I say, you know, you've been in, you've been in, uh, you know, treatment so many times before. Haven't you ever dealt with the trauma? And they're like, oh no, those those other places don't do trauma. So, you know, the trauma is the fire in the basement, as as I like to say. It's often uh, it's often overlooked or. It's just simply, oh, you can deal with that at another time. So until we have somebody that is that is dealing with their trauma, you know, the trying to treat their addiction is, I don't think it's really going to have a have a good out, outcome. And of course, we always want to assess the uh, suicidality uh, of people, it, and particularly in, in our military clients. So here's something we talk about the impact on veterans. When veterans uh, say somebody completes their tour, they do their four years in the Marine Corps, and they were deployed a couple of times to Iraq and Afghanistan, reintegrating into society is something that's been identified as a big problem. There's just there's just a sense that uh, you know military people feel that unless you've been there, you just don't get it. So a lot of them aren't raising their hands and asking for help. Oftentimes they'll leave the military, but you know they'll continue to engage in you know maladaptive behaviors or substance use. And they have a tendency to isolate. Again, it comes down to the symptoms. A lot of a lot of them have severe nightmares. They have depression to the point or intrusive thoughts where they basically they can't function. And they just when people leave the military, they just really feel like they kind of like they they've lost their family because even for people that come into the military that come from bad family situations, you know there's that that sense of finding your tribe in the military. Everybody that comes into the military finds their finds their group of of friends, you know, and that's such an like you know as I said earlier when you're in combat, 
you know, if you have your buddies with you, that's, you know, you have that to count on. So it makes it a little bit less scary. So that, that cohesion is a, is a huge thing. And a lot of veterans simply do not trust people uh, to include therapists and, and doctors that don't have any affiliation uh, with the military. So, you know, they just feel that other people aren't going to, uh, to understand them. Some of the maladaptive coping things that is very common, again, substance use, gambling. But I'm telling you, we have seen a huge intake uh, here at Sierra with people coming in that are having problems with sexual compulsivity. It's not uncommon to be in a uh, in a into a, in a wartime you know combat theater and have have people swapping images of porn around, and it's not even necessarily from going online. I mean, if you go if you utilize a government computer to go online to a uh, to a porn site, I mean you know you're done. They're probably blocked anyways. But there are people that deploy with terabytes and terabytes of hard drives of pornography. So uh, I don't know if we're just asking the question more these days about sexual compulsivity uh, or if it really is becoming a, a bigger problem. So most of the people, actually, there was a study that was a study was done showing that uh, compulsively sexual behaviors is, is a big problem in military people with, uh, with PTS. And this can range anywhere from, you know, anonymous sex or casual sex, casual sex going online to you know, different websites, uh, whether or not they're married, or, you know, pornography. Uh, so, anyways, that's, uh, I don't know if that's a common thing that is that is screened, uh, you know, when, when you guys are, are doing your intakes, but, you know, we have, here at Sierra, we actually now have a, uh, we have a little, a little track that we call it for specifically for people that struggle with uh, sexual compulsivity, and it's been a huge, huge success. So let's talk about the family. You know, for the family members, you know, the families in the military are often the unsung heroes. They are the ones that, uh, you know, the, the spouse keeps the home fires burning, and it's really important to include them as, as, as part of the treatment, uh, treatment plan if possible. You know, we have a family program here that, that we do at Sierra, which is an integral part of their treatment. But we know that guys that are guys and gals that are suffering with with PTS, uh, domestic violence has certainly been identified as a big issue. There's many marriages that end in divorce. You know, a lot of a lot of young uh, sailors, soldiers, and Marines they like to get married when they're E1 or E2s, and you know they're basically kids still, and then they deploy, and it's just not the not the healthiest way to develop a, a relationship as a, as a young service member. And of course, kids. You know, the kids are always the ones that that suffer. You can certainly read through that, the impact on kids. Kids, uh, kids experience trauma differently. Remember, you know, they're, they're not gonna, your kid's not going to come to you and say, hey, I'm having intrusive thoughts or nightmares. They're going to be more likely to uh, have bedwetting, you know, not you know, refuse to go to school. They're going to fight with peers. They're going to withdraw. Maybe their grades will suffer. Many kids are misdiagnosed with you know, ADHD because they're exhibiting uh, these behaviors. So exploring the children's, uh, you know, mental health history is really, really important as well. Fortunately, the military has pretty good resources for family members. I know in the Navy we had we had uh, something called the Family Service Center, which was which was really very good. And I know the Air Force and the Army and Coast Guard all have their own equivalents of that, where family members can seek help, you know, to include counseling and uh, you know take various classes on coping and et cetera. Okay, so assessment. This is pretty straightforward. You know, when, when we're seeing people, we want to make sure that we do a good, a good psychiatric evaluation on them. Make sure that it's it's very, very thorough. It's helpful if they have a recent physical exam, as well. I know that's not always uh, that's not always possible, in, in, in you know, in practices necessarily where, where where you are at if you're working as a therapist by yourself or as as a doctor. So the coordination of care, the coordination care piece is really huge. Uh, we can use screening measures. You know, you guys are familiar. We talked about the ACE earlier, but you know, for trauma, we have the PCL5, the primary care PTSD. And we have the PHQ9, which looks at, at mood disturbances, and then you know, uh, collateral information from family members is really beyond important because it's amazing uh, how much information we often don't get from our from our clients. As far as military clients go, the VA recommends that we don't just screen people one time because, you know, people can have waxing and waning courses of symptoms of trauma. You know, many people actually will go in, you know, periods of remission and then they can, they can relapse just like with a substance use disorder. So the VA recommends, you know, annual screening the first five and then every five years after that. 
and of course you can read what the assessment uh, should include there. And I, I just want to drive the point home. There's, there's no such thing as the average military uh, PTS patient. Everybody develop, you know, de everybody presents differently, and many of them are very, very complex. And you know, others can be relatively, I don't say straightforward, but we'll just say less complex. When we're looking at differential diagnoses uh, for PTS, you, you know, you can certainly read through that. Those are some of the most, the most common ones that we have. One thing I wanted to include in here is a traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injuries are super, super common, but the vast majority of them in the, in the military are, are they're, uh, you know, they're, they're very limited. You know, they're, they're not severe. Uh, I think 80% of people have a have a TBI at one point. It's also known it can be a, a concussion. But we know since 2001, about 400,000 service members have had TBIs, and it's actually the most common cause of death and disability for people under 35. So you can have a mild TBI, moderate or severe. Fortunately, most of them resolve on their own. So the, when you have somebody that has post-traumatic stress and a TBI, it can be really, really difficult trying to parse out those, those symptoms. Uh, we just know that it's uh, it's a very very important part of the you know part of the screening process as well. You can have a guy that has a TBI that can present, for example, as an ADD patient, ADHD patient with concentration problems and easy distractibility, and they can't follow through on tasks, uh, irritability. Many of them just you know present as depression. So asking the question about the the, the TBI is very very important. I want to talk real briefly about bridging that military-civilian gap. It's, it's well known that military veterans are more likely to seek help from somebody who is a veteran themselves, or at least have knowledge of working with veterans. So uh, I've had more than a few people in my time here at Sierra Tucson, uh, former military people, as well as first responders, that uh, they feel that civilian therapists, and we'll just say civilians, don't understand them. And that's okay. I mean, if you don't if you don't have any military experience, you don't have any military experience. But I think the cultural competence piece really is is important here. So there are some really good websites I'm going to mention uh, shortly, where you can go train yourself up and just become a little bit more familiar with uh, with military type stuff. You don't want to be overly informal with any of your clients. I mean, not that I need to say that, but I, that's something that I've heard from some of my patients. You know, in the military, rank is everything. So at least as you initially get to, to know a patient, addressing them as Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Or, or whatever is really important. And if you haven't been in a combat zone, please don't say that you understand because there's just there's no way to uh, there's no way to, to understand that. So and again, that's okay if you I mean, most people haven't been in a combat zone. So just be curious. Be curious as you explore the relationship, you know, with your with your military people. Okay, going on to treatment modalities. Uh, one thing I really want to emphasize is, as the number one therapy that is most effective for people with PTS is trauma-focused psychotherapy. Okay, that's first-line treatment. Uh, now, this you know trauma-focused psychotherapy in conjunction with medication can certainly be helpful as well. But most people don't want to take meds. Uh, they really don't. So there's different types of therapy that you all are far more familiar with than I am. But one of the most common ones I use at the VA is prolonged exposure. I know they're big uh, proponents of cognitive processing therapy. Uh, group therapy can be effective. It's not as effective as individualized therapy. And, of course, getting the spouse involved uh, can be beneficial as well as, you know, anger management. Medications. I just want to wanna stress this. I, we see people that come in here on so many different medications. It's... Uh, it's really, it's really troubling. We have a program at Sierra Tucson called Prescribing with Purpose. So we're pretty good at, you know, taking these people that come in on you know, a plethora of different meds and sort of, you know, stripping them down to, to what is absolutely necessary. I'm going to say that first-line treatment for PTS with meds is not, it's not Xanax, it's not Clonopin, it's not Valium, and it's not Ativan. Those are the benzodiazepines. Those, are, as a matter of fact, are not recommended for people with trauma. The first-line meds are SSRIs, so Prozac, Zoloft, uh, even a couple of the SNRIs. And I think Effexor is one of the approved ones as well. So, you know, first-line treatment for anxiety besides therapy is uh, SSRI medication. We have people that come in that are also on opiates in addition to benzodiazepines, and it's just... It really can muddy muddy the picture, the clinical picture, and it's hard to do therapy 
with somebody that's numbed out on so many different meds. Uh, and of course, we're seeing more and more people get their medical marijuana card and uh, come in and you know proclaim how wonderful that is for them. The, the, the results are mixed as far as studies go. I, I do understand that you know in uh, you know mild to moderate amounts, it, it can help with, with pain. I, that's, that's not my area of expertise. Most of the people that I see that come in that are using marijuana are basically waking and baking, as they say. And many of them have experienced psychosis and emotional numbing. They have withdrawal symptoms, and uh, you know it's it's just because somebody has a medical marijuana card doesn't legitimize. Uh, it's case by case. Let's let's just let's just put it that way. All right. Some of the more uh, common treatment modalities that you all are familiar with: somatic experiencing that has to do with re-regulating the nervous system. We know that animal therapy is huge. I'm not just talking about emotional support animals. There are actually many, many organizations out there that will uh, get uh, typically dogs for service members, and uh, they will work with them to, you know, actually for the animal to be a part of its therapy, to be able to recognize the the PTS symptoms and wake wake people when they're having nightmares or in any sort of distress. Exercise, yoga, mindfulness, meditation, and of course, addressing physical pain is a is a is a huge thing as well. One thing we do well here at Sierra Tucson is integrative care. So uh, we're atypical in that, in that we have so many services available under one roof, where I can, you know, walk down the hallway and talk to my my pain doc, you know, Dr. Davis or or whoever. I have a naturopath next door. Oftentimes, we uh, in the real world out there, when you're not working in a treatment center, we, we have a tendency to sometimes operate in silos. So the importance of coordinating care with a primary care physician or another therapist or pain management whatever is uh, is huge. Okay, these are just some of the newer emerging treatments. I mean, there, some of them are new, new, but uh, comparatively speaking, we know that ketamine has been shown to, to help with PTS symptoms. Hyperbaric oxygen, interestingly enough, uh, we have a place here in Tucson that does hyperbaric oxygen treatments free for our vets, and that, you know, typically takes multiple treatments. TMS is a trans... Cranial magnetic stimulation, this is not electroshock therapy. It's, it involves a magnet, and it's kind of like an MRI is the best way to put it. It's a loud, loud, clunky machine, but you kind of wear a halo over your head, and you receive these, uh, these, uh, these impulses uh, through the machine that is thought to increase blood flow to certain parts of the brain, and that can certainly help with depression. There is an FDA approval for uh, TMS. One of the newer things is a stellate ganglion block. If you haven't seen the 60 Minutes special on this, I think it was it was done about two or three months ago. Please go online and, and check it out. It's very very interesting. Stellate ganglion blocks is something that's done in the operating room. Uh, it's not an outpatient procedure, but the number of veterans have uh, that have had this have had a lot less depression, anxiety, and insomnia. And basically. You take an anesthetic and you inject it into this bundle of nerves at the base of the neck, and that results in dulling uh, the area that serves, you know, the fight or flight neurotransmitters. So it's instantaneous relief for many people. Again, it's it's not a cure all. Uh, I recently had one of my patients here, a former Marine, senior enlisted Marine that was in Fallujah, really, really has struggled since he got out of the Marines. Uh, he was in touch with me recently, and he had this done at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, and he says he feels like a different person. So, well, and, and this has been a few months since he's had it done. So, uh, I know the VA in Long Beach, I believe, is is doing this, and uh, this is typically not something that's done first line. We typically go through the therapy and we do the medications uh, and the other various therapies before you get to this point. There are also some new biomarkers. This is brand new, I, I believe, is the biomarkers. Uh, where we, you know we're going to be able to do blood draws and identify in people that actually have uh, PTS. Okay, so healthcare provider role. Again, let's make sure that we screen everybody appropriately. Let's include the traumatic brain injury and uh, do our best to treat them. If uh, you know if you are fortunate enough to have a VA in your area, I wanted to let everybody know that you can actually contact the VA, and there is a. Uh, you can consult with a VA professional at no cost. So if you're out in the middle of Iowa somewhere and you have no VA near you and you don't have any experience with military, reach out to the VA. And uh, they're happy they will get back with you. You can email them, go to the website, and uh, they will get back with you and sometimes call you as well. 
finishing up here, this is the very last slide. These are some resources for you. National Center for PTSD is an amazing website. You can even go online there and get certified in uh, prolonged exposure therapy, cognitive processing therapy. There's just a plethora of resources. For those of you that want to familiarize yourself with the military, uh, you know, the military culture a little bit, the Center for Deployment Psychology is excellent. The Psych Armor, just like it is spelled out there, is, is a great site. They actually, Psych Armor has 120 free courses that you can take to familiarize yourself not only with trauma, but also with military culture in general. And then, of course, the, the VA. So, all right. Thank you so much for your time. I know that you all are very, very busy, and I, I really do appreciate your time. There's my contact information. Please, uh, please feel free to call me. That's my cell phone, or text me, or email me if there's any uh, any questions that that I can help you out with, or to to talk about any patients that you may have. Again, uh, the red, white, and blue program we have here is, has proven to be a huge success, and I'm telling you, it really does take. Uh, a person to find their tribe, so to speak, in order uh, to heal in our military population. They need to be amongst you know, their, their own, so to speak. So thank you again, and I appreciate your, your attention. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do the, the Q&A now. We have about five minutes or so, and I'm sorry if I, if I can't get to any of your questions, but please feel free to email me or call me, and I will, I will definitely be in touch with you. Thank you all. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, take our first question, and that is, how do I know if my loved one is on the right medication? You know, I think that's, uh, that's a combination of a subjective thing, certainly from their perspective, but also I think our observations in, you know, noticing our loved ones and observing whether or not they're too sedated, uh, too sedated or do they look like they're blunted in some fashion, or, you know, many, many people that have, uh, for example, a uh, history of an addiction, will love the fact that they're on heavy dues, you know, heavy, uh, heavy amounts of benzodiazepine. So that's, that's not a good thing, obviously. I think uh, having an honest conversation with your loved one, getting a list of all their medications, and then something else that's really important is coordinating care. Uh, you know, here at Sierra, fortunately, we have all our providers under one roof, so, you know, I know what the pain management doc is doing. But out in the real world, we, we have a tendency to get involved in our own silos, right, where, you know, say I'm the, you know, I'm the primary care physician and I'm prescribing Zoloft, but then he's going to the pain management doc or the, the psychiatrist and he's getting Xanax and he's getting Vicodin. So again, it comes down to the fact, uh, you know, I think the minimum amount of medication necessary is important. And again, we want to remember the, you know, the SSRIs are, are generally first line for that. Not to say that benzodiazepines cannot be prescribed. It's always a case-by-case -case basis, but again, it's uh, you know, there's always the the uh, the risk of of abusing those, and you know, some people just get too numbed out on the on the benzos, and they can't really do the work and therapy that they that they need to. Uh, the next question is: Is the VA supposed to treat all vets who have been diagnosed with combat-related PTSD, even if the vet has private insurance and reasonable finances? Uh, the answer to that is yes. If you if you know if somebody served uh, served their time in the military and they have an honorable discharge and they meet you know, the, the criteria for care at the VA, then they are absolutely eligible for care. And, I mean, in my eyes, what better place to at least, you know, start your care, uh, you know, being, being with an organization that, that understands, understands trauma. It's a really important piece, I think, for veterans to, uh, you know, to have that camaraderie thing, as I mentioned, you know, to that find your tribe. And at least starting out with the VA and getting the ball rolling with, uh, you know, medication if necessary and various uh, therapies is, yeah, is, uh, it is their, their entitlement, absolutely. Uh, next question is, how do I find resources for treating military clients? For this, I absolutely would go to the website that I mentioned, the National Center for PTSD. I'm telling you, it is a, it is a plethora of wonderful information in there. I don't, I don't think that it necessarily has uh, you know, has providers listed, you know, if you live at a, at a facility where there's not a VA, but it has got so much wonderful information on, on how to deal with the military, you know, population and the culture. And I also mentioned that, that website, Psych Armor, uh, that's, that's invaluable. That's the one that has over 120 free, uh, free courses to help you kind of uh, familiarize yourself with the military. 
culture, and it has other resources too. Uh, the next question is, if a family member has returned from Iraq meeting the criteria for PTSD and reporting that he was forced to do things that he believed were morally wrong, is it an important part of the treatment to have the person recall the specific memories? We have a loved one that will not tell us or his counselor any details, but he does have nightmares seeing the faces of those he was ordered to shoot. You know, I, I will leave that to the, uh, to the therapists out there. I, I am not a therapist. I do know that there's, there's various different techniques, including with EMDR, where you, know, you can still go do good trauma work without having to recall specific memories. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's going to be long term, and uh, you know, that's an individualized treatment decision with the therapist, of course. So I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day and listening to this. It really, uh, really means a lot to me, and thank you so much.